Scissors are back. Ik heb het zelf al gevraagd, hè? Zo. Ik En los, los. Dat is flink. Dat is een flinke jongen, hè? Lekker stokje, hè? Hey jongen, wacht even. De licht. De lichtbalans, hè? Slaag, hè? Stop. Goed zo. So in this video we are going to talk about lion baiting. This is an uh, old blood sport where they use uh, dogs to combat lions. And uh, two lions are most uh, proficiently described. And one was uh, Nero and the other Wallace. And they are both uh, big lions. Whereas Wallace was a smaller one, born in captivity, and Nero was a bigger one. But uh, not born in captivity. I 
about uh, this uh, lion baiting. I showed you some pictures. Well, I will show you some pictures in a, in a video. They normally had uh, dogs against these lions that had uh, a chance, so to say, or a little bit of chance. But very often times, those lion baiting contests was uh, a means to show the superior superiority of the rulers over the common people. So, as you might know, the lion is uh, also known as the king of the jungle or king of all animals. And those kings also want to show how superior, superior they were and also that they were not even really attempting to fight. Such a things uh, were often placed upon the lion, also being majestic and uh, very brave. And lions are very brave, especially male lions. They're one of the only uh, animals that are known to be game as compared to a game dog. So for example, male lions are known to fight to death when, uh, even when they are faced with two other male lions who want to take over the pride. So one male lion is the alpha of the pride normally and oftentimes upcoming lions uh, they work together. Sometimes upcoming lions are alone but very often they are with two. The two younger male lions will then challenge one alpha male lion that's getting older and fight to the death because that older male lion wants to keep his pride otherwise he will die because his power is still there because the lioness captured a lot of food for them but they will wane off if left alone and therefore they fight so viciously the only other animals that are known that are dead games so to say or really game in the sense of, uh, in the sense of uh, a game dog are marten species so for example uh, badgers, wolverines, the likes, but also weasels and uh, ermines and some other martens are known to be very feisty, also polecats are really uh, feisty game little creatures very often times but back to the lion baiting, so oftentimes they use big mastiffs and because in dog worlds a massive is a big powerful dog, of course, but they were not so good as compared to the bull and terriers, which are the true gladiators, modern incarnations, and they were also used to fight bulls or bears, and those were let loose against uh, a lion. In the case of Nero, he was a lion approximately 320 kilograms, he was uh, facing three dogs. And those three dogs uh, were set loose on him, uh, all had to wane off, but their average weight was 18 kilograms. That one was a really thoroughbred, game bred bull terrier, and he was 60 kilograms. And the, the other two already uh, yeah, were mauled very hard, and only this Turk uh, purebred. Uh, Game bird Bull and Terrier kept her going on, and uh, he was 60 kilograms, as I mentioned, so 20 times smaller than that uh, big narrow lion. And now you might say 320 kilograms is very big for a lion, it cannot be done, but in the past, lions were a lot bigger than they are now because of being hunted by men, on the smaller lions normally survive, whereas in the past they had really big lions. And that's uh, proven by scientific evidence, it's also in the pictures that I will put up, so please take a peek. And on the other side, uh, there is uh, so he, he fought with his three dogs, but the contest was six dogs against his lion. And six dogs of 18 kilograms. Six times 80 kilograms on average would be 108 kilograms. And that's like 
one third, almost one third of uh, the weight of the Pinotinda kilogram, kilogram uh, lion. So the lion will, would be, if those six dogs are facing him uh, at one time, still almost three times as heavy as this, those six dogs combined. But he wasn't facing them all six together, they, he was facing them in sets of uh, three at a time. So it would be almost six times as heavy as the opponents at a certain time point. So you can imagine that uh, the dogs had been very heavy, but the third dog that already came out of a match was still uh, healing from its last match against a bigger dog that he was able to kill. Already had a swollen head and damage to its head before it faced the lion. And those three dogs stayed with uh, the lion for 11 minutes. And the tour dog died afterwards from its injury. So 11 minutes they were able to withstand a dog, uh, in dog terms, uh, an opponent that was three times as heavy of the complete set of dogs and six times as heavy as they were in their bouts. And after that they released uh, the second, uh, second three dogs, uh, because four, five and six. And then this big lion, Nero, got hurt and didn't want to fight anymore. So, those that were uh, from the lion camp said he won, because he was just too majestic to fight his mere uh, mortal dogs, still weighing six times as much as the bout he was facing, and three times as much as the complete set of dogs. But those at the dog camp said no, he didn't want to fight anymore, and the dogs would have killed him if they were. Uh, if the match wasn't stopped in favor of the line. So it was quite in inconclusive, to say the least. But still, it was given to the lion. And then they said, OK, we will bring another lion. And now they brought Wallace. And Wallace was a smaller lion, but enormously ferocious. So in contrary to this uh, narrow dog, he uh, attacked the dogs very hard all the time and he he also killed the dogs but he was now facing those uh, six dogs but Turk was not, uh, not not there anymore and that was the dog that was able to, to stick with uh, the gigantic lion for 11 minutes eh, before it was uh, picked up but 60 kilograms not a small feat but he died, as I mentioned. But on the other hand, of the six uh, dogs that were facing, were facing the this Wallace dog, there were also dogs from the first bout that were already enormously maimed by this narrow lion, and now facing Wallace. They took him uh, mere minutes, I mere minutes a dog to. Uh, to feed them. So, in summary, are dogs able to defeat uh, a lion? In the case of Nero, they were. In the case of Wallace, they weren't. Although, I must say that the dogs that were facing um, Nero, some already had injuries. Huh? I don't think it would uh, make that much of a difference. But four, five, and six of the first bout were able to close, close the deal. Whereas in the case of uh, Wallace, who also was released to face uh, three dogs at a time, or perhaps two dogs at a time, if you look at uh, different references, they said that they, in the case of Wallace, they decided that they have to, uh, the line has to face two dogs at a time, but for them for three bouts, and that could make it a lot easier, of course, because then it would be not. Uh, Six times the weight difference per bout, but nine times, and I think that just makes it uh, a big difference. That being said, also the Wallace line was 
uh, smaller than the narrow line so it could make it a little bit more fair again but still if the lions were facing uh, the same weight of dogs of this bull and terrier breeds i'm almost 100 percent sure that it would be different that the dogs would have won and just teared it apart of course some might might have died i think they would but uh, it's not to be said that uh, a gladiator type of dog cannot win over the same weight of uh, the king of an all animals and the king of the jungle also known as the lion which is a formidable warrior itself but the same weight was not tested in this bout there are stories known that six massives were facing one lion also a big lion so for the for the same reference it would be again a lion of 300 kilograms six massives would be the same size of dog eh, in kilograms if they were weighing about 50 kilograms a piece but on the other hand uh, a mastiff is a completely different animal than a bull terrier. So the six mastiffs didn't want that much of a piece of the lion and just were not able to put the resistance that they wanted. Whereas so the bull terrier just went in. And now you might be thinking that your dog is much tougher than a, a cat. But if you look at pets, cat pets are often very much stronger than that dogs, especially in the same uh, weight range. If you, however, are comparing a working terrier dog, for example, a Petterdale terrier, a Fell terrier, a Border terrier, of working lines, or a game dog type of dog, I would bet on that uh, animal over a cat, even in the same weight range. But. Uh, Dogs, pet dogs versus pet cats, I think 99% of the same weight, the cat will win. There are some differences between dogs and cats. And one is that uh, cats are extremely explosive, very athletic, also better uh, hunters. Even the pet cats are often a lot of better uh, hunter. But the dogs have a bigger heart and can go the longer haul. But those pet dogs don't have the temperament and also are not selected to perform anymore, whereas cats still are quite able to fend for themselves, have to catch rodents, catch birds and kill and eat them, even without the uh, support of humans, whereas dogs have it a lot harder. What I also found, for example, street dogs, that street dogs are known also to kill cats take into consideration that the average street dog is a lot heavier than the average street cat. Okay, I hope you like this video. Have a great day. Bye bye.
Witze, Junge. Hä? Hey. Sachkes, sachkes. Just nipped me a little bit on the finger. Just he stood slid off the ball. I try to give you a good view of him in this uh, beautiful light. Sunny here again for you. So you see it shine. Gorgeous little fella. So it's now one year, nine months, and oftentimes dogs mature up to two years, sometimes even further, but smaller dogs mature earlier. And he was already here, uh, quite ready after one year. Of course, you can have some minor changes, but that's uh, about as good as it gets. Nice, nice body, agile. The funny thing is with Petadils, contrary to many uh, other dog breeds, the females are often more bulky for their uh, size. So the males have longer legs in general. <laughs> and also uh, less uh, <laughs> they didn't pick it up. And that's uh, Less massive chest as compared to their size. Of course, the male is bigger and stronger, but for their size, those females are quite uh, massive. And I think it has to do something because they are smaller. You still want to have maximum presence when you enter them there uh, in the fox dens or badger dens. So even the females need to be very powerful. It's a funny thing. I hope uh, other people also have, uh, have found this out. Nice and shiny. More the territory. The sea is really shiny again. Once the uh, sunlight hits the coat, as you can see here, it's in the shadow. And then we go to the sunlight again, you just see it shine. Very nice. Very nice. So, one more time. Hitting sunlight now, there it comes.
Very nice. Hé hey, jongen. Ik denk je sniffed something. Perhaps a bitch in heat. He's really walking his territory now. Wel grappig, we hebben bij dezelfde hoogte, maar ja, twee keer zo zwaar. Kom, kijk. Hoi, hoi. Mooi, hè? Mooi. Voilà. Kom, kijk aan zo. De Sayoud. Ja, dat zijn we wel, hè? Hoi, hoi. Kom maar. Nice. Nice muscular too. I think he smelled something. Today we will discuss Russian white dog ownership. So what do I mean with this uh, term? If you look at uh, dogs, some dogs need quite a lot uh, of work, others are almost uh, carefree. And I'm referring to the latter. So for example, if you have a dog with a very nice fluffy coat, you also have to comb it a lot. Otherwise, the dog will get entangled and also dirt will build up. Whereas if you have a dog with a smooth coat like this, you have uh, no work. You do not even have to comb them, and still they look like this. Like if you feed them well and exercise them well, they will just shine from health. And uh, that's what I apply to. It's the same with humans. Eh? If you're a man, you can have very long hair. You can have a long beard, but it takes a lot of time to uh, keep it in a good condition. Whereas if you keep it smooth and easy, it's just wash and wipe. Uh, and you're good to go. Also, if he has played in the dirt, this little guy, I just take a towel and wipe him off once. <laughs> and it takes off all the dirt, all the moist, everything. That's a, an easy uh, thing in life. Another thing, you could also do it a little bit more on the psychological level. If you have a dog that is, uh, yeah, is demanding a lot of you. Also, in the way, of course, every dog should need to exercise and also mental exercise, etc. But sometimes if you have a dog that's so far away from the normal things that you do that you have to make compromises a lot and if so this can be quite intrusive for example if you have a dog that barks for every sound that it hears you will, uh, will go and adapt to that because you do not like this barking perhaps I would not but also if it barks you will think it's cry it cries wolf again Whereas if you have a dog that only barks when there's really something there and can discriminate between the normal things in life but also if something is really amiss you have the benefits of a 
uh, watchdog properties you will not have all the trouble also with people around you that uh, go, go nuts from all those uh, barks and that is something I really like also a dog that can be relaxed in house for example there are two elite uh, walking terriers at this moment and in my opinion that is the Petterbill Terrier and the German Jacht Terrier also known as the German Hunting Terrier but they have different characters Petterdills are far nicer in house whereas Jacht Terriers are almost uh, yeah, just, they, they keep on uh, being extremely uh, active almost neurotic in my opinion whereas the Petterdill Terrier can also have an off button so to say which I like a lot. So that's uh, my philosophy about a uh, wash and wipe type of dog. I'm not uh, promoting to wash your dog too, too much, only if needed. And sometimes it can be uh, only once in so many months or not, or never if he can uh, swim. But you should wipe it, of course, so that it doesn't uh, soil. Uh, the environment, especially when it's uh, has played in the mud, but just can you keep it easy and uh, keep it simple and uh, easy for you, also easy for the dog. That's my uh, philosophy, and that it doesn't mean that I do not have respect for dogs with uh, a bigger coat or that I cannot enjoy their beauty, because again. But I like this a lot more, more practical and also very nice bonus that you can see the musculature very nicely. As you can also see here with Estacada now, one year, nine months, have a great day. In this video I will show you an update about Lieso Estacado. It's now one and a half years old. I think you can now see him uh, walking and pulling uh, the leash. He's always like this. It's also very good for uh, its conditioning. I will switch it up. Most often he's on the leash, but also in the harness. It's uh, better that not only that all the forces will be on his neck, but you can divide it a little bit more. Spiky! Oh, he smells a bit, I think. See? Mark the territory. Spiky! So I hope this is a nice small update to show you how he's uh, maturing. Have a great day. In this video we will discuss the Bente Bulldog. And where does this dog sit? This dog sits between the modern day boxer and the ancestor thereof, <coughs> known as the Brabante Bullenbeise. So this is like a Dutch, because Brabant is a part of the Netherlands, the German type of uh, Mastiff. Or Bulldog, in my opinion. It's more of a Bulldog. Bullenbeise means in German uh, the dog that bites the bull. So this would more be uh, a Dutch German Bulldog. That being said, this dog is now extinct. It is one of the ancestors of the show dog that we now know as uh, the boxer. And that's a boxer population completely assimilated uh, the left. Uh, those left of the Bullenbeise, Brabanter Bullenbeise. Next to the Brabant and Bites, they also used especially uh, English uh, Bulldog blood and most dominantly English Bulldog blood of showstock to further flatten their nose. And the English Bulldog blood of showstock is in a later phase and uh, was used to refine the dog that we know now as the boxer 
has a flattened nose because of pug influences, which is just a show toy breed. It has no functionality. This also means that the boxes which is flat nose have lost a lot of functionality, albeit being a nice athletic frame uh, that they have, and also uh, a nice character, which is all good, but the functionality has been lost to a great degree. And that's what they try to restore by creating the Panther Bulldog. So, Bulldog is also uh, referring to the English term for Bullenbeiser, the German term. And Panther is a, a part of the Brabanter uh, part in this uh, breed. And it was the dog known in the Dutch regions and that so the Dutch region of Brabant and uh, those dogs were used also in Germany and they were referred to where they came from being Brabant as the Brabant the Bullenbeiser. So the Bente Bulldog is a recreation to some degree but they still uh, started with one of the um, the show dogs that we know known as uh, the boxer. So still they have some of the drawbacks of show blood, show blood infusion. And then they revigorate this with uh, a very good breed, a breed that is uh, the direct descendant of the English bulldog, but it was still a performance. Bloodsport Gladiator, which is the American Pitbull Terrier. So those two breeds are used to create a breed that we now know as the Bantam Bulldog. And this is a great increase in the health, performance uh, possibilities, and also a great contender at weight pool at events, for example, as such. Still more beating than the Pitbull Terrier, which is for its weight. A top contender in almost all sports participates in. But uh, a lot better than a regular boxer would do. It's a nice project, but for me it's only as, uh, as value as a sentimental recreation. Whereas the Bente Bulldog has descendants of the Brabant the Bullenbeiser, the former bred dog, and the English uh, Bloodsport Bulldog running to its veins, it still will be so far to a pure uh, performance type of uh, dog, such as. American Pitbull Terrier. So all the good parts come from uh, American Pitbull Terrier blood. It might have a nicer view if you want something like that. But uh, there are, were already breeds closer to uh, the original uh, Brabant the Bullenbeiser in his performance. If you would look at uh, Scott type American Bulldogs, for example, you could uh, come very close to the looks and also the function of uh, the Brabant the Bullenbeiser without the infusion of uh, show breed blood to show an uh, English Bulldog which carries pug blood. And that's the part I don't like. That being said, um, it's far better than the original boxer as a show dog and would, uh, would be a joy to have. Boxers have a nice uh, temperament but they're quite plagued with diseases, especially heart, epilepsy but also cancer and infusing a performance breed will greatly revigorate those uh, detrimental traits. So. I'm not against the breed, but I think it could do a lot better.
Hope you like this video. Have a great day. The dog on the leash here is a very small dog. Also carries Boo and Terrier blood. It is known as the Paternal Terrier, also known as the Black Fell Terrier or the Black Dogs. And this is smooth coated variety and also carries some of the original uh, Bulldog blood to its veins. That means especially of the Northumberland Terrier. Have a great day. In this video we will address the topic is there also gameness in the animal kingdom, so in the wild animals? And the short answer is yes, but they are hard to find and not many uh, are that. And why is this? Because in nature normally animals are there to survive. And if they don't uh, survive because they have games and they want to do to go on even against opposition that is much stronger so even if needed to the death they won't uh, be living long enough to reproduce their genes maximum, maximally so that being said let's look at some examples we will talk at least about lions we will talk about uh, Martin's family but we also talk about uh, some of the civet cat family. So first start with lions. In the animal kingdom, the male lions are those that have that gameless attribute. And why? The female uh, lions are the best hunters. So how come that those male lions are those uh, that have the gameless trait? Whereas the lioness are the hunters, the male lions are the protectors. So, especially if other male lions come and try to take over this uh, group of lions, and, uh, and uh, oftentimes they also kill, kill the lion whelps because they don't want to uh, yeah, raise other uh, male lions with genes but their own. And that's a big uh, problem for that group. Uh, you will be wasting uh, genetic diversity. And those male lions, once they get uh, challenged by another male lion, they will fight, even if that would mean that they would die. And sometimes they even face off with two upcoming male lions they will battle that one lion together and after that either be a, a two male two, so two uh, male lion uh, group or one will attack the other again so only one will uh, remain depends a little bit how the situation uh, unfolds that's an interesting fact other uh, very game animals uh, must be the family of martins. Martins, even if you get pet martins like ferrets, they will happily engage with uh, a cat four times its weight, which is also a very good predator, or uh, a dog, <laughs> even ten times its weight is very often the case. But sometimes even attacking herders like uh, Dutch shepherds, Malinois, and of course it would be very easy for such a big dog, for any bigger dog that's uh, to kill uh, a ferret if they are themselves still very capable boy. But oftentimes those household pets are already uh, bred to have such uh, a lack of courage if they will have a, a hard uh, time with a ferret. But so a ferret is a domesticated polecat and also polecats are known to fight cats, sometimes even uh, uh, venomous snakes such as uh, yeah, how do we say that? Uh, Tick viper is the best uh, way to describe them. We have European viper for example. And a similar case could, could be made for an entirely different family 
being that of the civet cats, where they have the mongooses fighting with the big venomous snakes and also killing them. But sometimes also those snakes kill them. So it's a very uh, interesting uh, thing. But other, let's stay with the martyrs family, other very uh, uh, game martyrs are, for example, the wolverine. Uh, that even uh, chases away wolves or bears or even polar bears from uh, their own prey <laughs> and it's such a compact gladiator other examples are uh, uh, river otters or other otters that even uh, fight and kill small crocodiles, caimans or also snakes eh? Even uh, small anacondas have been killed by them. Other examples are the, the, the meager weasel, who can be like 50 to 100 gram and killing rabbits more than 20 times its weight. And yeah, a rabbit is still, uh, still just a prey, but they will also engage very hard with each other. They will engage rats, and rats are quite capable of. Uh, killing animals, including their own, for the size they are quite big, and they will engage a bigger rat and kill it. They are really good, feisty little buggers. And you have a little bit bigger, the ermine, similar traits, polecats already you mentioned, but also uh, there are some martyrs that are less likely to fight including uh, tree marten and stone marten, but also you have the, uh, the fisher marten in the United States, like a smaller wolverine, also very interesting to, uh, to see. Then we had the civet cats, I already mentioned the mongooses, but also the jet cats, which is a different trait. And fossas are known to be uh, ferocious little fighters. Another example could be made for, uh, and as we get into this yet, there's another very big cat that is really uh, going. Hey, against a very stiff competition, and it could be either the snow leopard that you will even face off with four uh, livestock protection breeds, for example, Tibbet and Mastiffs, and also the Jaguar, which is able to kill anaconda but also crocodile types. But both the snow leopards and also uh, the jaguar are very fierce uh, and also solo fighting uh, big cats. And also sometimes Siberian uh, tigers or Bengal tigers face off with very strong uh, prey, even bears. So also very uh, uh, strong, and also a bear can win from a tiger, of course, but this is not the type of game that I was referring to. Another example of the Martin family would be uh, the badges. Badges are known for many a dog as the ultimate test. Some say that the otter is even a better test, but they are almost extinct everywhere in Europe. But very ferocious will not back down, but there's an even more ferocious uh, badger. I'm not talking about the American badger, which is a lot more aggressive than the European one, but a lot smaller as well. So therefore the European is often considered as a bigger prey, but also the American martin. The American badger is a very formidable quarry, but there are other examples, especially the honey badger of Africa which faces off on a regular basis with a very big, strong uh, competition, including, including lions, uh, panthers, even hyenas and the like. And uh, they also face off with cobras and other very deadly uh, material. They just very able to withstand them, but also they have a don't uh, care attitude. They will just face anything, a little bit like the Wolverine, but the badger has a better skin and an extremely sharp uh, 
long claws also able to dig. They also face off with, uh, with bee stings who don't just don't uh, seem to spot it that much. They crack open the entire beehive. They are an awesome creature altogether. Well, I hope you like this. If you like this video, I'm going to give you also a little bit more of insight that gameless can be a trait also found in nature. And why could be a big question. In case of lions, it would be easier to uh, explain. Uh, if that lion loses his pride, then he will be in big trouble. Because he's already old and it would be very likely that he would be overthrowing another male lion from its pride. So he has to hunt for himself. And often die. Whereas uh, the honey badger yeah, is just a, such a formidable warrior, and he, he tends to be uh, surviving also the wolverine. Many of other uh, big creatures will just move away when they see the wolverine because they already know how much of a warrior they are. Same with uh, honey badger, but uh, it's quite hard to understand why they pick such a formidable quarry. Perhaps because others don't, and they just fill the niche. But it's interesting to uh, come to our lives a little bit more. In the earlier video, we discussed uh, gameless in nature, and we gave examples of creatures that can also be game in nature. So gameless is the ability and the willingness to go on even if the uh, odds are stacked against you. An example would be the honey badger that will face off with a, a leopard or a big baboon or a lion. And other examples are male lions that defend their pride against other male lions, even till the dead. And multiple examples were uh, uh, mentioned, including also Wolverine and, for example, Mangooses, or Mongooses, so to speak, fighting with King Cobras, etc. But that being said, we didn't include canine members in this uh, overview. So canine members like for example the fox or uh, the wolf or jackal or coyotes etc. And that is a, there's a reason for that because uh, canines are very brave and also able to take down uh, big quarries. But they work very often in a group. And for example, solo uh, hunting canines such as foxes oftentimes don't take down a big quarry. And then you might say, yeah, I know a fox that has killed a lamb or, or killed a baby deer or killed a, a baby hawk. Yeah, sure, and they do that. And that's still a big prey for a fox. But the same size, this petrol carry would face off even with an other adult hawk. Not win, mind you, but it's a different kind of bravery. So how come that in nature where they have to fight to survive and also have a very harsh life, this game is not found in the canine family, whereas activity, domestication, so you will. Some members of the canine family are one of the gamest animals there are, and especially those that are bred for uh, the gladiator roles, being in, in the earth, and the terrier is working formidable quarry like a badger, or sometimes above ground against uh, the hawk that I mentioned, but especially those bred for the pit. Yeah, there were dogs that would go on and continue against other dogs even if they were ripped to, 
to pieces and still be friendly to the handlers but also dogs that would face off with lions huh? and everything they uh, threw at them and that's an interesting fact because that gives you also insight at what I mentioned earlier that I think the Bruin Terrier breeds are the most developed dog breeds there are because they are so much developed outside the scope of the natural uh, scope that a wolf, a natural canine has. So if you're interested in this topic, I also have uh, literature uh, studied about those uh, extreme uh, activities that they had. So especially uh, against the bull, but also against the bear, bear baiting. And against each other, of course, there's gladiator type Bull Terriers. Huh? The modern version of that would be the American Pitbull Terrier or the Bull Terrier of the past. But they also fought lions. I have a video about that. You can find that if you want to. It's called Lion Baiting. It's on my channel. So uh, please sit back and enjoy if you want to. And see you the next time. Bye bye. Zie je wat je aan het doen kan? Ja. Moet je een lapje hebben? Er liggen ook een citroen onder. Ja, die had ik niet. Het kan ook zijn dat die citroen wel hebben als balletje. Daar is hij ook gek op. Dat is niet om te eten. Dat is geen balletje. Kijk. Nee, nee, die kun je eten. Ja, die ligt op de schoot. Nee, nee, is niet. Is geen balletje. Is geen balletje. Ja, dat is het. Hoe is het mogelijk? Dat is het. Is geen balletje. Nou, zeg. Ligt ze toen boven. Het gele ding. Nou, dat was het, een balletje. Hij ben blij dat het wat, dat wat een balletje is. Zachtjes, hè? Ja, eh. Piano spelen, Spikey. Spikey? Ja. Hé, hey, jongen. Okay. <laughs> Dat is mooi. Dat komt jou vragen. Dat is mooi. This video will be about a dog in a self-defense situation. First of all, I want to give a reality check. If someone really wants to hurt you, a dog won't uh, stop them. So this day and age, it's very hard to defend yourself against someone who really wants to hurt you with a dog. That being said, there are still some cases to be made especially for a big type of dog that also has man stopping ability but I will also give you some insight what even a small dog can offer you in your safety so first of all if you really want a dog that can uh, defend you against the worst situations you should look for a big capable dog it is also able to uh, really have the character to go the long mile, the long haul, so to say. So this means a dog that has man stopping ability, so big enough to stop a full grown man. And that can be very heavy. A dog of 80 kilograms, of course, has a lot more man stopping ability than a smaller dog because that mass can be put into energy that is put against you and also would be very hard to wrestle off but even a dog with 40 kilograms a smaller male would be in big trouble and even a bigger male would have some trouble at his hands so that should be your primary focus but also a dog that has the attitude to go with it if you have a very big dog 
that doesn't have the attitude, the courage. Huh? It can be very easily scared off, or when it's, uh, it's, uh, it is on the receiving end of the infliction of pain, that's for example the perpetrator wants to inflict upon you and also inflicts upon the dog and it quits. Yeah, you just have a big sack of meat there. But still, that big dog could serve a little role because it could be uh, a deterioration too. So it uh, would make it harder for people to select you as their victim because they got deterred by this big, strong type of dog. So that being said, a dog of a Molossa type would be very well suited because Molossus has quite a good uh, deterring characteristic uh, because their, their size but also their uh, looks and also their character, they are really defenders but you should get one from working stock, preferably, or at least one that is capable of uh, defending you and also is willing to. So you should have a very capable, strong dog, but without the will, you're not going anywhere. So Molossus could be a good starting point, but I prefer the Bull Terriers as an infusion to Molossus. So in that case, you, you are looking at dogs that carry both the size of a Molossus, or part of the size, but also the courage and fighting ability of a Bull Terrier blood. And I would seriously look into uh, a dog that has a little bit of both. Could be a pedigree uh, dog, for example, a Burbu, Pila Brasileiro, or a Molossus, but are very capable. Or a dog like the Prince of Canary, who carries a lot more Burbu and Terrier blood in it as well. But even the Burbu carries some. So that could be a very good starting point. So that could be a good way to approach it. Another uh, way could be to look into serious band dog programs. So these programs are a little bit like a Preza Canario type. Uh, they carry both Wontaria blood but also Molossa blood. But are uh, currently still being in development for protection purposes. So some people will tell you they have band dogs but they just breed Bull Terriers to Molossus and sometimes you could have a very good uh, hit but also a lot of time uh, of misses whereas if you're breeding for quality you will get a lot of better dogs because those dogs are bred to perform at the task that you want them to perform at and they are good breeders of these type of uh, band dogs both in the the Eastern uh, European countries, more of Russia, I've seen good breeding programs, but especially in the United States. And I would like to point out that the American uh, Sentinel K9 is a really good choice to start with. And these programs carry an exceptional amount of bull and terrier blood. It's their main attribute. They only brought in a little bit of Molossa for additional size and perhaps some guarding uh, characteristics a nice horse eh? but they are predominantly just boon terriers mm. leaf, eh? but it could also very well be that you are looking at uh, a different uh, approach also midget mastiffs that uh, brings you a very interesting performance red band dog so, uh, really a close on the Great Dane and there are other very big breeds that you could look at for example the um, Bulikuta is also a Great Dane derivative but forward bred all the time so very good at it and it's also very massive great deterrent of those with ill intent but you could also be looking at something a lot more uh, in the cover, so to say, that you have still a lot of the properties there, but for 
example, a little bit more fluffy uh, type of dog. Me personally, I like the smooth coated dogs a lot because it's ease of use, also ease of cleaning. And I like to see the musculature as well, but you could also hide it a little bit. And then you could be looking at different type of breeds. Also an American Bulldog could be a formidable uh, protection dog. But still short, short head, but you could also go, go to breeds that have longer hairs, for example, dogs that are known as the Kango, but still for most people quite uh, intimidating. Alibi, also a little bit longer hair. Or Afshar, Afsharta, which is a giant and might be fluffy, but for most would be uh, not something that you can uh, slide under the radar. But there are other breeds that are, and I will disclose a few that might be uh, interesting to check out. The first I want to tell you about is the Hoverwart. Hoverwart is a German breed. It's essentially a lot of the characteristics of the German Shepherd, but without the sloping backside, so a lot healthier in the hip uh, dysplasia department. And it's also it's specifically developed to guard uh, yeah, things like this, farmland and the, uh, the terrain around it. They call that a, in a Dutch a hof. So in, in Dutch it would be a hofwacht. So it is like a sentinel uh, defending the home area. And it looks, you have them in different colors, now even in golden colors. And you could mistake many of people with a dog that looks like an athletic and bigger uh, retriever. It has a lot of uh, protective uh, qualities as well. Take this off. So that's one. Another one that I want to uh, mention is, for example, the Great Pyrenees, the Pyrenean mountain dog. This dog looks also a little bit like a, a golden retriever, but then a, then a lot uh, bigger and more white. But also, yeah, still lions that are quite capable and also in defending. So if you want something undercover, and there are other dogs that have similar attributes. For example, uh, the Kuvash, which is like a Hungarian breed, and looks a lot like a Pyrenean mountain dog, but a little bit uh, more athletic and less coat. And there are other dogs that could be completely uh, out of the pocket as what you normally would think of. For example, Commodore, a very big dog who looks like a giant mob, but is quite capable as well. So that gives you some insight for the, the less uh, obvious choices. But I was also promising that if you had a dog that's very small, for example, this small type of dog, what it still can bring you in safety and secure, security. Well, for starters, you have watchdog application. So the dog, even a small dog, can be uh, very helpful in showing you that something is amiss. So that's a very good thing because if you are, are alert and then you have a big advantage as compared to not being alert, it still doesn't offer you all the protection, of course. But even a small dog of good lineage would try to protect you. And protection, uh, we talk about protection especially from um, other humans, but even a small dog that uh, gets a grab and will try to hold, will make it harder for a perpetrator, someone with that ill intent to do the things that he wants to do. First of all, you are alerted, and if he attacks you and the other dog that you had, the dog that you have tries to help you, you will have a better chance. Also, if it's one perpetrator, his forces are divided between fighting you and dealing with the dog. So that can be very helpful, even a small dog. The other thing is that uh, sometimes people say, yeah, you need protection only against um, humans. But it could very well be, especially if you're living in a country where, for example, coyotes are active and they can snatch up your child or dingoes. 
that even a dog that sacrificed itself, the small size of this Petadil Terrier, would save your child. And there's also a very important factor. I find that most people are overlooking and uh, I do not agree with that. Also rattlesnakes, for example, Petadils are kept to deal with rattlesnakes as well. And of course the venom can kill them, but they rather have uh, a dead of a dog than a dead of a child. So I think also that uh, self-defense should be uh, thought of as a brother. And if you have a dog that's capable, even against a feral dog, also some countries really have feral dog problems. There are dingoes, uh, jackals, wolves in some countries, and then it could be beneficial that you have a dog that sacrifices itself so that you might have a bigger chance of uh, surviving. It's not that you should not help your dog, because I would do everything that I could. But it's a good thing to understand that also the sacrifice can be of one animal can be the mean the survival of a human. Have a great day.